We continue our look back at some classic Halloween happy pay-per-views, and this one, folks, we're celebrating the 30th anniversary for, I'm talking about WCW Halloween Havoc 1992 from October 25th at the Philadelphia Civic Center in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. This show was nominated by Adam Bodges over at patreon.com slash wrestling with regret. This show, of course, is most infamously known for the spin the wheel, make the deal gimmick, and this was something that finally is getting its time to show shine getting its due on NXT. They resurrected that a couple of years ago for their Halloween Havoc special and it's kind of carried on since then and I think it's kind of funny because for a long time that whole gimmick was lauded as this really bad really just goofy ass gimmick and to see them kind of revisit it so long after that has worn off like what's old and what's goofy hey it can be cool again in the modern era and of course the reason we all know about spin the wheel make the deal is primarily because of that really cheesy mini movie they actually first debuted at the end of class Clash the Champions 20. It stars Sting and Jake Roberts in a seedy bar somewhere. Medusa's got a side role as well. There's Cheatham, the one-eyed midget who's appeared in all these WCW mini movies around the time. And it ends with Sting and Jake shooting lasers out of their eyes and there's an explosion. I talked about this at length with Colt Cabana on my video about the mini movies. So you want to hear me talk about that video and also White Castle of Fear and Beach Blast 92. Go check that one out. 7,000 folks in the Civic Center. This this show did huge numbers on pay-per-view. It got 165,000 buys, the highest number for the company in three years. And boy, they sure got a lot of mileage out of that Haunted House 3D gimmick, didn't they? The show begins with Tony Schiavone and the latest addition to the commentary team, Bruno Sammartino. They put over Spin the Wheel, Make the Deal. They announced that Terry Gordy's not there tonight, so he'll be replaced by stunning Steve Austin for the tag title match. More on that later. We then go to Missy Hyatt, one of the few people in costume this year. She's reporting outside Rick Rude's locker room him, trying to get the scoop on who Rude's choice of referee is going to be in the NWA title match later on. And then we go back to ringside. You got Mayor Jesse Ventura and Jim Ross calling the action. Your first match here is a six-man tag as Arn Anderson, Bobby Eaton, and Michael P.S. Hayes take on the Z-Man, Shane Douglas, and newcomer Johnny Gunn. They might as well have that might as well have been his nickname because every time they referred to Johnny Gunn, it was newcomer Johnny Gunn. He is also known as Tom Brandy, Salvatore Sincere, and the fake Patriot because he stole Del Wilkes' gimmick. And how about this tag team super group over here? You have Hayes who recently joined Anderson and Eden as their strategist as the Dangerous Alliance is kind of like floating in the wind right now. The white meat baby faces are not feeling the love in Philadelphia here. The fans aren't too receptive to these guys, but they love the Free Horse Express. That's my new name for them. Shane Douglas back in WCW and his gimmick right now, he's one of the young up-and-comers are trying to push in this youth movement in the, in the company. His whole thing is he's kind of like the successor to Magnum TA. He's got the belly-to-belly -belly as his finisher. He's got the seal of approval from Magnum TA a couple weeks ago on Saturday night. Uh, yeah, so he's the plucky baby face and he really wants to make a change here in World Championship Wrestling. That's the way he pronounced it. Weird inflection. You've got to talk about World Championship Wrestling to be the best in World Championship Wrestling. Right away in the opening match, we have the weirdest line of commentary all night when Jesse Ventura just randomly says, I'll bet Shane Douglas is a right-wing Republican. Like, okay? Z-Man gets worked over here. Smooth blind tag to Arn Anderson, which gets a huge pop. And not to be outdone, Eaton chop blocks Douglas. That also gets cheered. I can't get over how much the fans love the heels in this match and how much Arn keeps working the crowd for it. Big head collision out of the corner allows Shane to tag in newcomer Johnny Gunn. All six guys in the ring now. Gunn hits his running Fez press, yes that is his finish, on Hayes to get the win. I give it two stars out of five. The match itself wasn't that great, but really it's the crowd reaction in this one that makes it for me. And when I was watching this, I thought, oh my god, it's going to be like this all night where the crowd's really just going to shit all over the baby faces, but they really don't. It mostly just happens in this match here, and I think the weird phenomenon is, I think just when Michael Hayes is just around, everyone is going to cheer for him regardless whether he's a face or a heel. So yeah, the baby faces don't get cheered here. Those white meat baby faces, not all about it in Philly. Missy Hyatt still outside Rude's locker room but can't get in. Here comes Harley Race. She gets faved by a beefy arm. Missy says that's the first time she's never been invited to a locker room. I'm going to go to a special challenge match here as Flying Brian takes on Ricky the Dragon Steamboat. Uh, Pillman is a heel now. That happened a month ago at Clash the Champions. He and Brad Armstrong were supposed to fight for Armstrong's light heavyweight championship, which is a relatively new belt in WCW at the time. 
but then Armstrong was injured and couldn't defend the belt in 30 days, so they stripped him of the championship, and they announced, oh, we're going to have a tournament to crown a new champion very soon. Stay tuned. And like two weeks later, Bill Watts goes on the air. He's like, oh, actually, we'll do the legal matters. We can't do the tournament now, so it's going to happen maybe someday in the future. Actually, never. I'm killing that belt off for good. So yeah, no light heavyweight division anymore. That belt's gone. So Pillman turns heel because he's mad at Armstrong for not being able to defend the belt. He's calling him a coward, even though he's bla he's definitely injured, but calls him a coward for not defending it, and that kind of sets off uh, Pillman's heel run here. And during this time, he actually starts tag teaming with stunning Steve Austin, and the rest is history. Steamboat's good in the early going against Pillman. He hit the big arm drags and the slams. Then Pillman pokes Ricky in the eye and takes over. He sandbags a few Irish whip attempts, then decks him. Steamboat blocks a superplex attempt, goes for a flying nothing, but Pillman hits the drop kick. Fight on the outside a little bit. Pillman hits a cheap shot in the ropes, tries it again, but Steamboat stopping it. Steamboat with a big top rope sunset flip, a lot of pinfall attempts back and forth. Finally, Steamboat with the winning pinfall. I give it three and a half stars out of five. It's a good match, and these two are just great workers. Uh, not a lot of heat to this match, though. Not a lot of reason for these two to fight because there was no storyline building to this. It was just kind of a, I think it was supposed to be a TV title match at one point, but then Steamboat loses the belt to Scott Steiner really soon before this, so it just becomes kind of a, a, a match just for the sake of having a match. But yeah, it was still a great match. We go backstage to find Teddy Long, the victim of a huge rib, because he's got to try and pronounce the names of these Japanese wrestlers and officials. We can see Mr. Kintsuki Sasaki of the NWA champ, Howard, Mr. Chono. We then see Shivani on stage with Bill Watts, and the two of them do a lot of explaining for the next few matches on this show. They explain that Harley Race is Rick Root's choice of referee to counter Masahiro Chono's pick of Kensuke Sasaki. They explain Terry Gordy's been suspended indefinitely, which is why he's not in the tag title match tonight. In reality, he no-showed after having a big falling out contract-wise or negotiation-wise with uh, Bill Watts, and so that's why he left. And an update on the U.S. title match situation, because right before before the show, a week or two before, they announced that Rick Rude was going to have to wrestle twice because he was already the U.S. champion and he was going to fight for the NWA championship against Chono, but because Polly Dangerously had this contract, even though they weren't really officially like working with each other anymore, uh, Dangerously still had this contract in effect that he signed for Rude to defend the U.S. championship against Nikita Koloff. So he, Rude was going to wrestle two different matches and they made a big deal out of it and then they explained here on this show, Rude has filed an injunction to prevent that match from happening and so now you've got Big Van Vader has been chosen as a surrogate to fight Nikita Koloff. Uh, he can still lose the belt on behalf of Root if he loses to Koloff here and that's how we get this match here for the U.S. Championship. So it's worth mentioning at this point that after Wrestle War, after War Games earlier in the year, the Dangerous Alliance it was really starting to fall apart at the seams. So now we're at this point here. Meanwhile, in real life, behind the scenes, Pauly Dangerously and Bill Watts do not get along. So Paul Heyman is definitely taking off TV for a while as they try and find what they're going to do with him. And uh, that explains why Eaton and Anderson have kind of gone their separate ways. Rick Rude and Medusa are doing their own thing right now. So that's why there's this tension right now between Dangerously and Rude, because right now I don't think anyone knows what the actual story is going on with the former Dangerous Alliance. Anyway, the match begins now. Vader overpowers Koloff early on. Big clothesline gets a flippy bump. Koloff comes back, taking Vader off his feet. Vader's had enough and he powders. On the outside, Vader roughing up his opponent, using a chair, gets dinked in the head with a beer from a fan. This match is no DQ, by the way. Koloff starts fighting back. He ends up kicking out of the big second rope splash. Koloff tries breaking out of the chin lock. He just drops Vader down, but they recover. Koloff going a big run here. Hits Vader with a big body slam. Full head of steam, but he runs right into the corner post. Koloff hits a wall. Vader with a big power bomb, and he pins to win. I give it three stars out of five. I love to see the big boy battle. Something like, it's funny, because the day before I'm recording this review, I just watched Wardlow and Brian Cage on Dynamite, and that's the same kind of thing. Two huge guys who are also super athletic, just having a real fun physical matchup, and that's what this was to me. I thought it was very similar in that regard. Also, this turned out to be Nikita Koloff's last match, or at least one of them, one of his last matches. He got hit with a clothesline by Vader in this match, and apparently that really injured his neck, and so that was kind of the beginning of the end of Koloff's career. Teddy Long backstage with Steve Williams and Steve Williams. Dr. Death seems to be as confident about this match no matter who his partner is. Elsewhere, Missy Hyatt's with Dustin Rhodes and Barry Windham, the unified tag team champions. Can they put their vague, unexplained differences aside? Windham downplays the rift between he and Rhodes and says they have quite the challenge ahead of them. We go to that match now, the unified tag 
tag title match, that's NWA and WCW, as Dr. Death Steve Williams and Stunning Steve, filling in for Terry Gordy, challenged the new champs of Dustin Rose and Barry Windham. They beat the Miracle Violence Connection in an upset to win the belts a couple of weeks ago on TV. It was actually spoiled earlier in the episode in the Halloween Havoc update, which was pretty funny. But soon after they win the belts, there's a week where Windham can't make it to a title defense in time, so you got Brad Armstrong like, filling in for a match at one point, and like mid-match, Barry Windham pulls down Rose off the apron, and they have this kind of shouting match, and then things are hunky-dory after that. It's never really explained what this thing was, but it seemed to be the catalyst for it, and they keep asking about it, and at this point in the storyline, at least, like there's no real explanation. Dustin and Dr. Death do a little three-point stance-off. It's a stalemate at first, but then they do it again. Williams hits hard. Dustin hitting right back. You'll love to see it. We want Flair Chance start up as Steve Austin finally makes his way into the match. Great back and forth with he and Rhodes. Wyndham spending a long time getting worked over here, but he finally makes his big hot tag to Dustin, falling back into his corner. Dustin hits the bulldog, but the pin's broken up. Dustin is decked. Now he is the one who takes the heat for a while. Austin has Rhodes up on his shoulder for a backbreaker of all things. Wyndham comes in to hit him, and Austin just no-sells it, which I love. Dustin going for a little flip-flop and fly, but he walks right into an Austin punch. Time running out, as we can hear from the ring announcers. The beating continues for Dustin. Wyndham makes the tag. The referee misses it. Rhodes thrown over the top. Wyndham's going nuts. Referee is knocked out of the ring. Nick Patrick comes in. Austin covering Wyndham to win. The match seems to be over, but Rhodes turns out to be the legal man. The match continues. A roll-up. Another two count, but the bell rings again. Oh my god, there's still two minutes left. How are they going to cover for this? Dustin hits a tombstone on Austin. The clock reaches zero. The match ends in an awkward draw. I give it three and a half stars out of five. This was a pretty darn good match up until the ending with that whole mishap with, oh, Rhodes was the legal man, not Barry Windham. Then there's the match restarts, and then there's the roll-up. And you feel like that's the finish. And even the guy ringing the bell thinks it is preemptively, but it's not. And there's still two minutes to go in this match. And they got like, well, now what do you do? You've killed the crowd because you had them pop twice for it uh, back to back. And you can't get that back. So it ends in this just really awkward place. And boy, they sure picked the wrong time to kill the crowd at this point in the show. We're on stage with Polly Dangerously, Harley Race, and Vader, who's holding Rick Rude's U.S. title. Polly takes credit for Rude's success, then Medusa walks in to introduce herself to Mr. Van Vader. Dangerously has had it with Medusa and just spends the next minute chewing her out in front of God and everybody, saying, you know, you're nothing but a woman, you're stupid, you're not as good, you're inferior, I'm a man, a man, 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 woman, woman, woman. He says the only reason that he hired her to take care of Rick Rude's needs was because the other hooker he was going to get in touch with had a prior engagement. And she basically fires her in front of everybody, gives her a shove, but then she kicks him back and goes after him to a massive pop. It's a pull-apart brawl with all the security, including evil, evil Grizzly Smith. But the big thing here is that Medusa gets a huge pop, one of the biggest of the night. And now after all the hype, it's finally time to spin the wheel and make the deal. And man, they can't help but make this shit feel awkward. We go to the stage, Sting shows up, and the wheel slowly ascends from below. All 12 of those match types are shown there. And what's the Prince of Darkness match? That's never, ever explained. Then when the wheel's done moving, a stage hand moves the lever and plugs it into the wheel. Holy shit, they couldn't have done that ahead of time? Sting pulls the lever, the wheel spins, the sparks fly, and it finally lands on the Coal Miner's Glove match. Sting's like, cool, see you later. On we go to the worst match of the night as we get a rematch between Rick Rude and Masahiro Chono for the NWA World Heavyweight Championship. Several weeks ago in Japan, Chono beat Rude in the finals of a tournament to win the belt, but Rude contends the referee cost him the match, which leads to this rematch here on American soil with not just one, but two referees, a Japanese ref and an American ref, Kensuke Sasaki and Harley Race. Rude is sans mustache here. Medusa shows up at ringside with him, even though she was just fired by Polly Dangerously and presumably turned babyface. Ole Anderson is there to do a coin toss to determine which referee will be in the ring for the match. He checks both refs. A very verbose and lengthy coin toss process means Harley Race is the man in the ring. Ventura insisting that all Minnesotans speak fluent Japanese as a second language. Rude hits some clubbing blows early on gets the headlock cinched in. More we want flare chants for a bit. Chono working over Rude's arm and lower back for a bit. Rude powders and Medusa wants to help him but Suzaki gets in their way. Like what the hell? Chono gets Rude in the Boston Crab then a minute later the Camel Clutch. Rude overpowering Chono decides to get a pose in. This is minutes after Jim Ross said on commentary oh that bodybuilding pose and stuff that's the other guys. A very long chin lock gets some big old boring chance. Chono goes to the STF which the crowd pops for a little so it's good they actually 
actually recognized the move. Rude comes back, hits the pile driver. You can't put Chono away. Rude misses the flying nothing, but recovers nonetheless. Back to the chin lock for you, Chono. At this point in the match, Ventura is just openly talking about how he wants to see Jim Ross arm wrestle somebody to give you an idea of how compelling this match is. Something way more interesting is happening off in the audience. Some fight somewhere, which gets a big pop. Rude goes for a top rope missile drop kick, but he misses. Ouch. Race takes one of the biggest damn boots I've ever seen by Chono. Rude thrown over the top rope, collides with both referees on the outside. Rude back in, hits the Rude Awakening. Both referees still selling. Rude goes back up top. He misses the knee drop. Chono with the STF locked in, but Kensuke enters the ring and calls for the bell. Ventura going nuts because that's Race's call. Harley says that he caught Chono throwing Rude over the top, so that's a disqualification. The title does not change hands. Race getting into it with Sasaki, who fights back. Dex Rude, body slams Race, tears his shirt off, and looks like a Chippendale dancer. This match gets zero stars out of five for me. God, it was a match that sucked and then had a crap finish on top of that one. And what happened? Did Rick Rude lose his mustache and then all of his wrestling powers dried up with it? Like, oh, this thing was rough. This is a match that really killed the reputation of the NWA for a long time in America, for sure. On we go to the WCW Championship match as Ron Simmons defends against the Barbarian with Cactus Jack in his corner. Back in August, of course, Ron Simmons beat Vader, uh, taking Sting's place to become the world champion. Big moment there for him. And uh, one of his earliest defenses was at Clash of the Champions 20 against Cactus Jack. He won that match. Cactus suffering an injured groin muscle there, so he's not wrestling for a while, but he has been coaching and motivating the Barbarian to challenge Simmons for the title. People question my ability to manage, but I'm not a manager. I'm a motivator. Weeks of these ridiculous training segments that show Jack like hammering cinder blocks on Barb's back, having him get body slammed by a bunch of dudes, kicking a pumpkin. A barbarian is getting a big old push here, treating it as a very big deal, but like, you can just tell, this guy's not winning the match. Also, Butch Reed and Tony Atlas have been involved with Cactus's crew as fellow folks of the grudge against Ron for some reason here. They barely explain the relationship between Simmons and Reed during this thing. You'd think they would spend more time talking about it, but they really don't. Theodore Long comes out with Simmons and a ton of security. Cool moment there, given their history. Sizing up early on in the match, some big collisions with no results. Simmons finally takes Barbarian down. Barb comes back in, starts hitting some big blows on the champ. On the outside, he's bashing him in the ring post as the referee's distracted. The blue meanie in the front row says hi to his mom. By the way, there are some notable uh, members of the audience here tonight. Not just a young blue meanie in the front row there, but also the ECW hat guy is there and Vlad the super fan. Barb's got a long Cobra clutch applied. Ross also says it's called the Shinonomaki, and that breaks Jesse's brain. Simmons is prone. Barbarian goes for an elbow but misses. Simmons fires back, hits the spine buster, slams him around. Cactus is on the apron, but he gets decked. Barb bonks Ron with a deadly boot, almost slips on the top, but recovers, hit the flying head, but Ron still kicks out. Simmons catches him and hits a power slam to win and retain. I gave it one and a half stars out of five. It was a whole lot better and more exciting than the Rick Rude Chono match for sure. So it gets uh, top marks for me compared to that one. I mean, this was, you know, again, it was very obvious Barbarian was not winning this thing. Uh, Ron Simmons wasn't exactly setting the world on fire as champion, unfortunately. The moment of him winning the belt was a lot more significant and a lot bigger than pretty much anything he did, unfortunately, as actual champion. Tony and Bruno have a chat up on stage, chatting about the youth movement in WCW, including Eric Watts and Shane Douglas. Here comes little Eric Watts, and he gets booed. He is dying out there on the microphone as Ron shows up on stage. Ron just got done wrestling. He is out of breath, but he is still able to cut a far better promo than Eric just did on the live mic. On we go to our main event. It's the Coal Miners Glove Match, unsanctioned by WCW, as the man called Sting takes on Jacob the Snake of Roberts. Jake, Jake, you dumb bastard. This man famously did everything he could to get out of his contract with the World Wrestling Federation. He wanted to leave. He even uh, he gave away his merchandising royalty rights to the company in order to get out of the contract. He did it because he apparently had this real sweetheart deal with uh, Kip Fry back when he was running WCW. By the time Jake gets out of his contract with the Federation and comes to WCW, Bill Watts is in charge now, and he and Jake have heat. And so needless to say, Watts 
not is not honoring that contract. And so Jake is working for far less than he originally intended per match. And boy, I mean, talk about just dropping the bag. So Jake debuts in August with a beatdown on Sting. This is the injury angle that opens the door for Ron Simmons to win the title that night. So what's Jake's motivation in all this? As far as I can tell, it's just he wants to eradicate Sting from the sport. And that's pretty much it. Damn, your first day here swinging for the fences. You go, man. Jim Ross on commentary saying, we have the anti-venom in case a snake shows up, which people have kind of interpreted as saying, oh, they're giving it away that a snake's going to show up, which I'm like, yeah, it's like a pay-per-view match with Jake Roberts. I wouldn't be, I would be more surprised if a snake didn't show up, honestly. Look at that tall ass pole holding that glove up. Jake looking bored as he applies the headlock in the early going. He works Sting's back with multiple knees. Sting driving Jake into the ring post a couple of times, goes to the glove for the first time, but is caught, of course. Sting attacking the arm. Jake goes to the glove, but he gets crushed, falling gracefully. Working that arm a lot more is Sting. On the outside, Jake decking Sting with a chair. He's strangling him with the wrist tape. Jake hitting the short arm clothesline and the DDT. He seems to have hurt himself in the process, though. He tries to climb. Sting recovers. He swings around the pole to hit him. That was very athletic. Cactus Jack runs in, and he's brought in the snake, that dreaded black cobra. Sting has the glove. He decks Jake with it, which causes Jake to push the snake up to his own face and hold it there for a while as the pinfall is made. I give it two stars out of five. Honestly, this match would have been better if it was a one, if it were literally any other stipulation than Coal Miner's Glove. What a boring match that is. I'm sorry. I mean, I came from the Northwest Territory and the Coal Miner's Glove match is like a big deal amongst the fans of the territory there. The old time, like Dutch Savage. No, I don't care. Coal Miner's Glove, boring as shit. And this match really exemplifies that. I would have liked to have seen them wrestle any other match, even a regular match. Because, I mean, how often did Sting and Jake Roberts really wrestle each other? I think, you know, if Sting, if Jake was, like, on top or if he was really on his game, that would be an amazing matchup here. But we don't get that here, obviously. And then the finish with the snake is really goofy and it looks so fake because the way Jake has to, like, physically put the snake to his face and there's still daylight and you can see it. But you know what? They teased a snake. We got a snake. And at the end of the day, that I think is all that really matters here. Roberts was soon gone from WCW after this because he was, uh, they explained in kayfabe that from this point forward, the snakes were banned from the arenas and he was supposed to be in the King of Cable tournament. Great name, by the way. But he was uh, released before the tournament could really begin due to what he called his personal demons at the time. My grade for Halloween Havoc 1992 is a D. And whew, this was definitely a tale of two shows. Like, I think with Halloween Havoc 90, a show that I thought, like, going into it, I thought was going to have a, a much worse time of it was a show I actually walked away from, mostly kind of saying, oh, there's a lot of things to enjoy here. This one, not so much. Like, the undercard is a lot better here than it is, like, the last part of the show with, like, the two world title matches and the coal miner's glove. But even those matches aren't that great and not really enough to kind of pull this show out of the doldrums. So, yeah, it takes a huge nosedive after that tag title match. That awkward finish really makes it, it's a harbinger of things to come is all I'm saying. Well, let me know what you thought of this review in the comments section below. Also, what do you think of Prince of Darkness matches? I want to hear your thoughts. Next time on the Classic Review, we are moving away from Halloween Havoc and going on to the November tradition of Survivor Series. We're going to 1987. Until then, I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.